Hello and welcome to Why Everything is Bad Actually. Here we talk about the problematic beginnings and backgrounds of things that many of us know and some of us love. I'll be your host for today. My name is Dave and I've got an episode today that should be quite interesting. Uh, I think for my best friend here, Jack, who's going to be along for the journey. Yes. Uh, so yeah, before before I go ahead and ruin your day, Jack, how are you feeling right now? Um, I'm I'm okay. Uh, feeling pretty hyped actually. I had a job interview. Nice. Uh, a little bit ago. Nice. Um, my my back's feeling as good as it'll be for a little while. I nice. Expect. That's something um, for you, I guess. Feeling pretty comfy, pretty chill. Yeah, yeah, well done. Not doing so bad. Nice. So, Jack, you're having a pretty good day so far. Yeah, not Up so until bad. the point where I walked into your house and decided to tell you what I'm about to tell you. Oh, I haven't. Before. Well, I haven't told you in any way the subject of today's episode. No, I? I'm coming in absolutely blind. Yeah, not I haven't given you a single clue. No. I will start with a couple of clues. Okay. So, what's the first thought that you have if I say? Mazda. Probably Miata. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. that's probably okay. the first okay. thing that pops into. What about if I was to say animal oh. welfare in science? Yeah, well, well, scientific testing uh, and stuff. I don't. Not. Not a fan. Know, no, not, not, not a fan. necessarily not a fan. Not no. a fan of animal welfare. No, 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 no. no. I'm not a fan of animal testing. I'm big, okay. Oh, I think animals need some welfare. You need animals okay need with... some welfare. Okay, you're okay with animal welfare. What about <laughs> if I now say German? nationalism between oh. 1920 and 1945 oh no <laughs> no this does not sound good so oh, the man we're going to talk about today is the missing link between these three things oh god i don't think i need the missing link between uh, those yeah he was he was born on the 13th of august 1902 uh there is an award for good animal welfare in scientific research which bears his, as you're soon to find out, very funny name to this day. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. And he is also credited as being the only person to have created a new type of internal combustion engine in the 20th century. Was it? Felix Wankel would eventually go on to invent the Wankel rotary engine, which oh ended God. up mostly being used in Mazda cars in its production life. I'm very upset by this. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so um, okay interesting felix was the son of gertie wankel and rudolf wankel oh, which are objectively God. funny names <laughs> <laughs> oh excellent germans of the 20th century committing atrocities with comic book names um, wonderful names so the wankels did have some other kids as well but uh, as far as i'm aware felix was the only one to really do anything of note Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, that's, fine. Can, that's what you're here for. How, how many, how many giggles am I allowed at uh, Wankel? Oh, I've put it in the script about as many times as I can. Don't you worry. Uh, <laughs> oh, <great. laughs> yeah, don't you worry. We're, oh. And I'm, sh- I'm, I, I'm very much aware that it's going to be pronounced Wankel or something yeah, by yeah, Germans, yeah. but no, I'm calling him Wankel because that's 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 what people call the engine. That's what people know him as. He's Mister Wankel. So that's what we'll be calling. I feel him. like he's gonna at least deserve that name. Yeah, my my running sort of working title for this episode is Wanklestain. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know if Spotify will let that on. No, maybe not. We'll see. Anyway, so so the Wankels lived together in La, which is in southwest Germany, not far from the banks of the Rhine. Uh, his father was a forest assessor, which, to be honest, doesn't sound like an unpleasant job to have at the turn no, of the 20th century. That sounds really nice. Yeah, if you compare it to like coughing up your lungs I in mean, a soot filled industrial city. Did you say in the Ruhr Valley? Uh, the Rhine. Rhine the Valley. Rhine. So, yeah. okay. Forest assessor. I mean, we're talking, yeah. we're talking literally the turn of the 20th century. I mean, the guy's born in. Felix forest. was born in 1902. So you've got most people getting their limbs ripped off by giant machines uh, in factories in that, you know. Yeah. It's yeah, definitely, yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, but he wasn't, they weren't like upper class or anything. He wasn't coming from like a, a rich upper class background or anything like that. Okay. But they weren't poor. So he's talking about whatever a sort of middle class upbringing looks like in early 1900s rural Germany. I don't really know what that looks like exactly. But basically he was able to go to school, get an education. And obviously this proved pretty consequential about 100 years later for enthusiasts of 
fast Japanese cars, weirdly enough. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to have to go on a little bit of a history lesson here. I know you know some of this, but it's nice to have a little walk through it. So in 1914, all of Queen Victoria's descendants decided to play with their toy soldiers together. And yes. the heads of states of most of Europe and also Russia went to war. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was um, a good fun time. I'm making a case here actually early on for Queen Victoria as actually being one of history's greatest chaotic neutrals. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. We'll probably come back to this at some point. But yeah, <laughs> she's an interesting one. But anyway, we're not really talking about World War One today. Um, it does bear a little bit of relevance to our story as Wankel Senior, good old Rudolph the Red Nosed Wankel, had decided that the Kaiser <laughs> was his guy. Um, so as a reserve officer in the German army, he went off to fight in France, aged 47. Oh, jeez. Yeah. No, don't do that. Yeah, how do you think it went? Poorly. I would imagine poorly. I would imagine. By the time that the Christmas Day truce was called on the trenches of the Western Front in 1914, Daddy Wankel was dead in a ditch. Oh, my God. Yeah, he didn't even make it to the end of the year. Okay, so knowing a little bit about World War One, yeah. yeah, without trying to deal with it. It hadn't really it. started. No, it hadn't really started. No. Well, really. I mean... Not in 1914. No. Well, I mean, it hadn't, it hadn't. It hadn't, it hadn't. It hadn't really ramped up into trench warfare as we know it. But uh, it, it was... Still, home by Christmas. Yeah, exactly. It was still a fast pace. He didn't Napoleon make it home by War. Christmas. Yeah. yeah. No, he made it dead by Christmas. Jeez. Yeah. But little 12-year-old Felix, obviously, now got no dad. Mm. Um, so his mother... Remember Gertie Wankel, which is oh, possibly oh, the best name in the whole story. Yeah, Gertie oh, Wankel. Gertie, you know, Gertie Wankel. Wankel. Yeah. Oh my God. So Gertie Wankel and the rest of her family picked up their belongings after the demise of Rudolf and headed to nearby Heidelberg, which is basically the nearest big city. Mm. Um, Felix would actually live most of his adult life in Heidelberg because he wasn't too adventurous. Great. So. Although little Wankel had been going to school and was stereotypically German with his interests in mechanical engineering and the new and exciting technology of internal combustion engines, once his mother was a widow, she couldn't really afford to keep everything exactly as it had been before. So the family had up and moved and Felix attended a high school in Heidelberg. But ironically, he actually struggled to get his head around maths and physics of all things in what? an academic co- context. Yeah, yeah, what? yeah, he couldn't, he couldn't figure it out Wankel written down on paper. Spinny Dorito and yeah. couldn't do maths. Couldn't do maths and physics, apparently. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, he left in lower grades of high school without a high school diploma equivalent or A level equivalents, or whatever. So he was never able to progress on to any sort of technical college or university. Never had any formal qualifications. Oh, I can, I can vibe with that. That's yeah. fine. You know. Yeah, yeah. He got like an honorary like- degree or maybe two of them or whatever later on in life from some fucking German university. But yeah, yeah. probably Heidelberg. I, I don't really pay much attention to that. What, who awarded him what for being cool? Cause I don't think he was very cool as you're going to find out. Oh no. Yeah. So obviously, obviously with no formal education in engineering, he wasn't able to pursue a career in that straight away. He instead settled for working in the field of publishing for Winter Verlag which is spelt Winter Verlag. Like. Basically, they're, they're basically, they're the oldest publishing house in Heidelberg. And at the time, they were a big employer. I mean, they still exist now. It was just a job. It was just a job for him. Um, they're not of a lot of note in the story. To be honest, I had a little look at what they publish and what they have published in the past. And it seems like they're quite a liberal liberal sort of publishing house. Okay. So it seems like it was just a, just a day job for him. Um, Does he obviously, not kind of take those values forward? He's not really, no, taking anything from it or giving anything right. to it, no. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Damn like, blast. obviously, if they did put out Nazi propaganda and shit, they're not probably posting that on their social media right now. So maybe I might be wrong. But I don't actually think they're the bad guys here. Yeah, I think they're probably I. Right. Okay. Anyway, Wankel started working there as a publishing clerk in their purchasing department in 1921. But his real interest did remain in engineering. He used to just spend all of his free time reading books on engineering and engineering concepts and things that had been thought of maybe, but never been produced or anything, anything like that. So interesting. he was in, essentially just like, if he was in the 21st century, he would be listening to like engineering podcasts. Yeah. And watching YouTube, how to do how it yourself. To do it. Wow. Yeah. 
yeah okay so he's reading so he's reading about lots of stuff in the library and not really doing anything much practical but in 1924 he and a couple of his friends set up a machine shop in a shed in someone's backyard and just started sort of playing at being mechanics and trying to develop their engineering skills okay yeah now also during this time period 1921 onwards when he goes to work little wankle is obviously growing up <laughs> and he's figuring out who he's gonna be as we all do in our late teens early he's, 20s he's turning from a little wankle to a big wankle yeah felix wankle decides that he wants to be a nazi oh no don't do don't do, do the opposite of that the, the literal opposite of that in 1921 wankle joined a right-wing anti-semitic group the german nationalist protection and defiance federation God. in heidelberg Oh my god, so these were the guys that were probably fighting with communists in the streets. Oh yeah, yeah, these were guys fighting with communists in the streets. Oh my yeah. god. In 1921. Yeah. Yeah. And then in 1922, just one year later, he decided that it was time to up the ante and he joined the National Socialist German Workers Party. Oh no. Yep. That's right. He, he... Felix Wankel was a fully signed up member of the Nazi party in 1920 fucking 2. Oh my god. Yes. That's that's like That's a long time ago. That's a long old time. Like that's like early in the history of the Nazi party. Yeah, he he bumped into this guy called Adolf. Yeah. Just so, coming out of the hospital. Well, well basically as I said, you know, in 1922 the Nazi party wasn't as big as it was going to end up being. You really had to want to actually be a Nazi. Mm -hmm. Um You've obviously heard a lot of stories about people in all sorts of careers who claimed that they'd only ended up working with Nazis because they felt like they had to. And however much in individual cases that might or might not be true, definitely wasn't the case for Herr Wankel. Um, Wankel was very heavily involved with the Nazi party. His mother was uh, also involved. She helped him and some other Nazis to establish the official Nazi party branch in Heidelberg. So... Unfortunately, oh, Gertie Wankel no, Gertie was Wankel. a piece of shit oh, too. Oh no, Gertie, I had such high hopes. No, she was a piece of shit. Oh no. So she moved... Absolute wankles. Absolute wankles. She moved back to Lara in 1924 and Felix moved into a small, depressing outhouse apartment in order to remain in Heidelberg. So he didn't want to go back to the sticks. He wanted to stay in the city where he had his career going on, yeah? And his Nazi party. And all of his Nazi friends, yeah. Um, yeah. Being, being a Nazi in the 1920s definitely says something about the kind of person you are. Yeah. You're a Nazi. Yeah. Wow. And I don't want to hear anyone talking about how, like, some people supported him early on because they just thought for some reason that they were just trying to, like, rebuild Germany and do something good. They were anti-Semitic and open about it from the start. Literally, the Nazi party officially announced that only people of, quote, pure Aryan descent could become members of their organization in 1920 when they were very first actually a thing and Hitler was in charge as of 1921 and he was very open with his anti-semitism from the start Famously. like there's plenty of evidence of it like don't let anyone tell you that otherwise like Hitler was fucking anti-semitic from day one and open about it I, I mean I obviously I knew that yeah yeah he was just a scumbag yeah from yeah day one but just horrific how quickly it all spread around Germany. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing how quickly it blew up. Yeah. Um, scary. Very scary. And like, I, I keep having this image in my head of someone going to like a anti-vax protest yeah. and then ending up in the Proud Boys. Yeah. Or how about someone? How about someone going on Facebook, reading a few posts, clicking a few links, and ending up storming the Capitol? I think that's a better example. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Funnily enough, in 1923, the Nazi party had their storm the capital. Famous Bill Hall Putsch. Mm. Yeah. It was a bit like storm the capital from the QAnons and the neo-Nazis, but a little bit less successful. Um, <laughs> the Nazis, it turns out, weren't as good at it as the QAnon shaman. As I say, they weren't very successful with this. Mm. The Bill Hall Putsch didn't really work. And the Nazi party was banned as a consequence. Hitler was put briefly behind bars. Um, well, Felix Wankel decided that as he was not allowed to be a Nazi currently, it would be an excellent time to get involved in starting some new nationalist paramilitary youth organisations. 
Lovely. Yeah. I mean, what a time to start. Fascism. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, now, I know, Jack, you've heard of the Hitler Youth. Yes, I have. The idea of that sort of thing wasn't actually new within Germany. So the German youth movement was a cultural and educational movement which reared its head around 1896. Started off with quite good intentions. It was encouraging children to just go outside, engage with outdoor activities like camping, a bit like Boy Scouts, similar youth organizations and clubs that exist to this day. And not all of them are bad. Emphasis on all. But yeah, they're not all bad. Just 90%. I wouldn't even go that high. Uh, depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends where we'll, we'll probably are. cover some of them in future episodes. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, back on to this particular one, the German youth movement. Basically, as Germany made its way through the early 20th century, many of these organizations became quite a lot more political in nature. And they began teaching ideology to the kids, mm. as well as starting to sort of train them as soldiers. Is it the, the good ideology? I guess it depends on your opinion. Uh, so not like, be nice to everyone, no matter who they are? Or... Mm. I don't think that's what they were teaching them. Don't no? think that's what they were teaching them, no. Mm. No. It sounds like a not good ideology. It's probably a not good ideology, yeah. Oh, Rather no. than focusing on just sort of building a good relationship with nature and the world around them, they were like trying to shape the next generation into like no. some sort of perceived ideal of what they wanted them to be, you know. So Wankel, through these youth movements and organizations, kept his fingers in the Nazi pie while the party was officially outlawed. And in December of 1924, same year that Wankel starts playing in his machine shop, Hitler gets released from jail and starts campaigning for the ban on the Nazi party to be lifted. What? No! Do you want to guess guess how long it took for Hitler to get the Nazi party ban lifted? Oh, oh, I'm going to guess, like, something horrific, like, three weeks. Uh, Well, more like a couple of months. Okay. More like a couple of months. Okay, so it wasn't like... Hitler gets released from prison in December of 1924, and the Nazi party is allowed to be officially a thing again in February of 1925. So they forgot after two years that these guys are probably not the good guys of history. I mean, just because someone's not a good guy doesn't mean you can just like ban them from existing. Well, I mean, where do you draw a line? In Jack? modern Germany, where do you draw a line? In modern Germany, <laughs> they I draw think a line. They've, they've, they've drawn the line, and I pretty much agree where they've drawn it. Fair enough. Anyway, if only they enforced it. But that's another matter. <laughs> so Wankel is back and officially back on board the racist train again in 1926. And he keeps up his involvement with youth movements as well, which seems good, right? Oh yeah, wonderful. This guy, I wouldn't trust him around kids. Well, a lot of people did. Well, yeah. Seems it, like such a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the people that did think it was a good idea were Nazis. To be fair, they are full of bad ideas. So... I've not heard many good ideas from them. No, I don't... The only the good only idea, one... the only good idea that Wank ever had, right, was in 1927. And I can almost get behind this decision. He decided to quit his boring day job, right? The As Nazi. working in a publish, well, working um, in a publishing place. Yes. Yeah. He quit his boring day job and he just wanted to focus on his passion for engines. So I can, I can get that, you know, quit your boring day job, go work on your hobby full time. Dude, it's what we would love to do. I would love to do it. Yeah. But unfortunately, Wankel is, however, claiming unemployment benefits for a little Ooh. while, while he's also working on a self-employed basis. Uh. So he's not only a Nazi, but a benefit scrounger. Which, like, being very, very <laughs> clear, benefits are a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but he's, however... He's however, claiming them fraudulently. No, a, he's claiming them fraudulently, and B... He's a Nazi. He's a Nazi. <laughs> yeah. So fuck him. Anyway, he is actually trying to do his best to turn his crappy little shed workshop thing into a viable business. Uh, him and his buddies managed to produce a few components for other engineering companies. And they managed to make a janky one-off three-wheel prototype car. This isn't with his own built engine. This is a with a with an outsourced engine. He um, built a reliant Robin. Yeah, pretty much, but not as good. Was it was it the right way round? I have not seen a picture of it. I don't know that there is a picture of it. I did <sighs> did have a little look. Couldn't find anything on it. Don't even know what it was called. 
But he started expressing his interest in like experimenting with new unconventional types of internal combustion engines, that sort of thing. One of the other guys that was involved with the project had actually been to university and he'd now graduated from university with an engineering degree. So he was able to put his name up on the front of the building and Wankel used his high-end Nazi connections to get an introduction to a man called Joseph Goebbels. Oh, no. Like, I thought you were going to say, like, ah, uh, he used his Nazi connections to get in touch with Ferdinand Porsche. Well, no, Goebbels helped them to get some contracts with DKW Motorbikes. Oh, uh, what? And their company starts sort of, like, turning a profit oh, almost no. immediately. Yeah. So this is in 1927, the same year that he's quit his job. They've got already so got these contracts. Straight up. Straight, straight oh away my. turning a profit, yeah. So he because walked of his out Nazi of his connection. first job. Yeah. Into a Nazi successful self-employed business because Nazis, Nazis. yeah, 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 yeah. Joseph Goebbels got him some contracts. Oh, no, yeah. So the next year in 1928, Wankel had been making big enough waves in the Nazi Party and in the German youth movement to make some very unpleasant people pay quite a bit of attention to him. He was pushing for the education of German children to be more technical and more focused on engineering and technology, like you might kind of expect he would. And although a lot of people in the organization didn't necessarily fully agree with him on everything, in 1928, he was given an opportunity to speak before a meeting of high-ranking Nazis, including Adolf Hitler himself. Oh, no. Yes, Hitler has made his appearance in our story. Oh. <laughs> it seems he made a pretty good impression with the top Nazis, because a couple of years later, in 1931, Felix Wankel was given leadership of the Hitler Youth in Baden, which is obviously a no region of Germany. Way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, like I said, you know what the Hitler Youth is, Jack, but I don't know how much all of our listeners already know about it. Uh, in most basic terms, it was an organization for children and teens. It was voluntary at the start, but it became compulsory. And it was a bit like a cross between the Boy Scouts, Army Cadets, and a political cult of personality based around Adolf Hitler. Would you say that sums it up? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Ugh. Not a good thing. No. Not a good thing. No. In fact, I would say it's probably... One of the worst one things. One of the worst things. One of the worst now, things. Now, yeah. as someone that has has had direct consequences from some of the worst things, one of the fact, the worst thing he ever did. Well, explain that, Jack. Uh, so, uh, as I'm Jewish. I've had uh, family die in uh, Auschwitz, and I think Hitler is is a big poo. A big poo. A, That's Jack's <laughs> official stance on Adolf Hitler. Yeah, big He's poo. He's a big poo. Yes. Okay. No, Adolf, no, 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 you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, just it, to give our, our listeners a bit of context. Yeah, a little bit of context. Yeah. It's kind of a bit close to me. A bit close to home. Yeah. That's why uh, I thought you'd enjoy this story, Jack. Yeah. I thought you'd enjoy thanks. finding out all of this information about Wankel. He he's living up to his name so far. Oh yeah. <sighs> the Wankel tried to push for change within the Hitler Youth. Oh, uh, that could be good. Yeah, you know, that sounds like it potentially. Yeah, yeah, that could be a good thing, right? Yeah. He, he has <laughs> he come to manage, a point. He didn't manage to keep himself in charge of it for very long right. because of this. Uh, right? I was going to say he came to a point in the road yeah. where he could have made a good decision. Think he could have done something good here. But yeah, after he took over in 1931, he started disagreeing more and more and more and more with high-ranking party members uh, about the direction that the party should be going in. Uh, was that... I mean, he was a brown shirt. He probably was asking for more more violence, I would imagine. Well, no, Nazis are notably pretty militaristic, right? Yeah. Um, this had been the point of contention for Wankel, to be honest with you. He'd been given control of the Hitler Youth in Baden by the local head of the Nazi party, elected official and all-round man of the Aryan people, Robert Heinrich Wagner, right? Wagner's stance on militarism was nowhere near aggressive enough for Wankel. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. so he's, he's, he's chosen the wrong path again. Yeah, so Wagner thought that the Hitler Youth should be predominantly about sort of propaganda, political training, cult of personality, ideology... Wankel saw it as an opportunity to train Germany's next generation into an army of super soldiers who would have no problems at all conquering Europe and exterminating the Jewish people. Oh, great. Yeah. That was his goal the whole time. That was, that was yeah, right from the start. That's He's 100%. I mean, like, we're comparing him to Wagner. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, about um, Robert Heinrich Wagner, but he's not a good dude. Yeah, so Wankel was too militaristic for the Nazis, 
And after losing command of the Hitler Youth in early 1932, so less than a year after he'd been appointed, he continued to try to tell Hitler and co that they weren't being aggressive enough, basically. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah, yeah. What year is this? This is 1932. 32. <laughs> and okay, yes, so yeah, horrific. they weren't they weren't aggressive enough. In October of 1932, Felix, too militaristic for the Nazis, Wankel, was expelled from the National Socialist German Workers' Party. They kicked him out. They didn't just put him on the bench, they kicked him they out of the squad. They kicked him out of the squad because he was just a bit, he was too good yeah, for the so, Nazis. Too good at being a Nazi, that is. Too Nazi for too the Nazis. Nazi for the Nazis. Oh. So yeah, Wankel seems to have been a little bit scared at this point. After expulsion from the party for voicing his opinions too loudly, and for, he was allying himself with the wrong Nazis as well. So, uh, but anyway, he got expelled from the party. He closed his workshop in Heidelberg, which he put down to you know suffering pretty badly because of the economic depression, which wasn't untrue, but also coincidentally, just after he got kicked out from the Nazi party, he closed the workshop and he moved back in with his mum in La. Oh, yeah. lay low. So wait this for, whole wait for the time, heat to die down. He, this whole time, he was a giant he was, pansy. He's a giant pansy. So just... he seems pretty scared. Gets expelled. Moves back in with his mum. Um, but he wasn't finished with his political career. Wonderful. Yeah, one of the people that Wankel had got into trouble for being friends with was a piece of shit called Gregor Strasser. Don't know if you'd know that name. I don't. That's a new name to me. Okay. Well, Strasser had been a lieutenant in the German Imperial Army of World War One serving in an artillery regiment, and he was a very prominent figure in the early years of the Nazi party. He played an active role in the Beer Hall Putsch, was arrested and sentenced to 15 months imprisonment. But, 15 months? But because he was an elected official at the time, and because nothing ever changes, he managed to get himself released after a couple of weeks. You're joking. No, nope, no shit. You're he joking. He was like, I've got a job to do. I'm an elected official. And they're like, oh, sorry, mate. Better let you go. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So he's right. He's widely regarded as being the man who was responsible for using his good organisational skills to develop the Nazi Party after 1925, from just like a bunch of regional kooks into a national movement, which would go on to dominate the Reichstag. Um, um... So he's pretty responsible. Pretty responsible kind of dude. He went on to have policy disagreements with Hitler, as many people did. He was eventually kicked out of the Nazi Party at around about the same sort of time as Wankel, but he managed to maintain a close enough relationship with the Führer to be appointed as the head of the Berlin subsidiary of IG Farben. No, what? IG Farben, no. yeah, the people that made Cyclone B, the oh, gas which was used no. to kill Jewish people. No, i not. Thanks. I, I, oh. So, yeah, he wasn't a good dude. No. But at least he was murdered in 1934. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, okay, I yeah. can do with that. That's... The Night of Long Knives, when I... Hitler decided to have all of his political opponents within the Nazi party murdered over the course of a weekend, one of those people was, in fact, Gregor Strasser. Mm. So before, I, I... before his death, before his death, right, Wankel had used his connections and he'd used Strasser's influence and Strasser's knowledge, etc., to help him to create his own little splinter group of national socialists after he'd been expelled from the Nazi party. It didn't really get very far. I don't think he had massive ambitions for it to get very far. He was mostly using the organisation to continue attacking his old friend-turned-enemy, frenemy, Wagner. Yeah. In 1933, the Nazis seized control of the Reichstag, and Wagner was suddenly a lot more powerful as a result. So he had Wankel arrested in March 1933 and thrown in jail for being a prick, basically. And it looked like... What? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Nazis will be Nazis. Nazis will be Nazis. Yeah, they Even will be Nazis. They're, Nazis they're the cattiest Nazis. bitches in the world. They are. Yeah. they're just horrific. Yeah, he was locked up by Wagner, and it looked like that could have been it for Mister Wankel. But oh no! Fortunately for him, he was enough of a Nazi that some of the other Nazis still liked him, and eventually Hitler's own financial advisor, Wilhelm Kepler, the mutual friend who had originally introduced. Wankel to Goebbels. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, he intervened, vouched for Wankel, got him released in September of the same year that he was arrested. So he only spent six months behind bars. So Nazis threw him in jail for being too much of a dick, but also too much of a Nazi. Yeah. And, and then, then another Nazi. He was like, no, 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 he's my Nazi. Yeah. And because he was a high enough Nazi, he was higher Nazi than Wagner. 
and so he was allowed to let him out. I just... Yeah, so after Wankel's... I mean, government's never changed, do they? Government's never changed, no. After Wankel's release from Nazi timeout, his old buddy Goebbels, who by now held a position in Hitler's government of Minister for Propaganda, and oh. yeah, that was his official job title. Imagine that on That's your CV. That's a wild... Like... <laughs> Obviously, Minister like, for Propaganda. Minister for Propaganda, not even like going the modern Russian route of Minister of uh, Communication. Yeah, even in the 1930s, like, like, like it was, yeah, okay, Minister for Propaganda. Uh, he was, up. yeah, okay. he was one of the most hardline exponents of the extermination of Jewish peoples, even within the Nazi Party of the mid 1930s. Mm. Um, so, yeah, he helped good old Wankel to secure contracts from the Minister without portfolio which is in itself just a terrifying job title. That. Uh, Do you know who the minister without portfolio is? Or was? On, was. You'll know the name. Hermann Goering. Oh, no. Yeah, so he was Hitler's right-hand man. Yeah. Um, once the Nazis had seized power in Germany, one of the many things that Goering did was to begin nationalising particular elements of German industry and redirect resources and manufacturing towards military armament and production of the mechanisms of the Holocaust. That was his job. He was the logistics chief, basically. One of his many jobs as minister without portfolio. In 1934, Wankel signed a contract with BMW, noted manufacturers of engines for German military aeroplanes, amongst many other things, to produce some internal components for their engines. And he received funding through his powerful Nazi friends to build a new factory and begin production of parts to help with the military stockpile that preceded World War II. So yeah, we're talking 1934 here. He's building a new factory to make components for BMW engines to go into planes. In 1936, he'd impressed Goering well enough that Goering stated, quote, this man is to be supported most generously. Now, Jack, if you're wondering where I got that Hermann Goering quote from. Where? I pulled it from wankelmotor.de. No. The seemingly most kind of official online bio of Felix Wankel. Yep, they used a quote from Herman fucking Goering to big up their guy. That's incredible. Yeah. How it, dare they? They're not trying to hide it. In... Like, I didn't, like, for this whole, all of this information that I've got in this episode, a bit of Googling, a couple hours of reading at most, and it's all there. None of it, I didn't have to, like, hack into something or, like, pay for information. It was, this is just right the... there on the internet. They're not ashamed of it. Goddamn shame. Shame is a good human instinct <laughs> wankel celebrated his promotion by getting married to a woman called it's either emma kern or emma kirin i saw it spelled both ways couldn't really find much information about her but they stayed together for the rest of their lives so i'm going to assume that she was an asshole yeah yeah yeah. That's, yeah. that seems fair yeah <laughs> uh so yeah obviously he's building component components and stuff like that for aircraft engines mm -hmm. uh from 1937 through to the start of the war Wankel's factory and a range of products it was producing had been expanding and growing continually. And at the outbreak of war, this only increased and sped up as Wankel got fully on board and involved with support in the Nazi war effort and Hitler's unbounded aggression towards everyone who wasn't of pure Aryan descent, as they would call it. Bastards. So Wankel kept on working with the Nazis throughout World War II, helping to develop a full aircraft engine in 1943. Oh, uh, I... Mm. What... Yes. What an absolute... What an wankle. asshole. Yeah, it, that was just one thing among a lot of... He made a lot of components and parts that went into other engineering products. It was, you know, it, his his work went into a lot of places. He was actually at the forefront of Nazi technological developments that worked, which was really fucking rare. Like, most Nazi developments don't actually work. They weren't good technology, but his was some of the few things that actually was. I'm just really upset yeah just... and this allowed him also the freedom in his in his spare time to be still carried on trying to develop a new type of internal combustion engine just for the fun of it while millions so, were dying so wait you're telling me the dorito was just a passion project while making components for the luftwaffe yes that's exactly what it was <sighs> The concept, well, the concept of rotary engines had existed on paper for a little while. It wasn't entirely his idea from scratch. Mm. Like the idea of it had sort of existed on paper. 
um, Wankel had come across it while he was doing all his reading that he did back when he was working at the publishers. By 1944, though, he'd amassed quite a lot of research and information on how to design and build a rotary engine in real life, not just on paper. But he didn't quite manage to get a working prototype put together before the Nazis lost the war and Hitler shot himself in the face in the damp basement. Oh, in oh, you know what? Hitler really took one for the team there. The one good thing that Hitler did was, was he killed Hitler. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 That was the one the one thing. So good news, Jack. Wankel was actually arrested by the French at the end of the war. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And all of his research was confiscated. Oh yes. I don't know if any of them actually bothered reading it while the French had it, but if they did, they didn't think it was worthy of public comment. As far as I'm aware, it just got put in the fucking bin. And understandable. I mean, engines already existed. And I don't know what else he was researching as well. No, sorry. I'm sure it probably wasn't just that. They they looked at it and went, no. Right, Jack. Yes. I know that you know what a rotary engine is. I do. Some of our listeners might not. Um, I'm not going to be able to describe the intricacies of the whole design in a comprehensive way without making a whole other podcast. So in the simplest possible terms, a conventional engine uses pistons moving up and down to create motion. This motion is then converted into circular motion by a crankshaft, and this in turn drives the wheels or propeller or whatever you're powering with said engine. A rotary engine, however, uses a complex geometry to have a weird triangle spinning inside of a weird oval to create the same sort of effect, but directly with rotational motion. So there's no conversion required and therefore in theory, on paper, it could be made to be more efficient. Mm-hmm. But only in theory, because rotaries are shite. I like a rotary. They, well, not anymore, apparently. But Yeah. So, anyway, Wankel had his plans, obviously, put on hold by the Allies at the end of the war. He wasn't imprisoned, because most of the Nazis were just let go. But he also was not given back his research. And he was prohibited from working on development of new technology, having to take manufacturing contracts as and when he could get them just in order to sort of keep a roof over his head and keep his business turning over. This unfortunately did not last for very long. By 1951, Wankel was back on the up and he was building a technical development centre at his own home in Lindau, where he'd now moved to after his business endeavours had started paying off again himself, got himself a nice house. He somehow managed to persuade a company called Goetze, Goetze, I don't know, I can't pronounce it, it's German, some company to invest in his concepts and help him to realise these dreams. Now, Jack, I'm not saying that the Nazis never really left power in the immediate aftermath of World War II in Germany, but the Nazis never really left power in the immediate aftermath of World War II in Germany, did they? No, no, they didn't. They were still in a lot of Nazis in very powerful positions. Mm, a, lot of, a lot of local governments really yeah. run by Nazis. Wankel was able to pretty much pick up where he left off. He began working at his new development centre in collaboration with NSU Motor Works, and by 1957, he had produced a working prototype of the rotary engine. So Wow, so he was like the first to ever do it. This is why it's the Wankel engine. Yeah, the war set him back about 10 years. Because oh, he lost poor, his research. Poor Wankel. Poor Wankel, wank yeah. Uh, this engine had a whopping 21 horsepower. Ooh. Yeah, and was weird and inefficient even compared to like Wankel's next prototype, let alone anything else that's ever been made. It was January of 1960 before a fully functional Wankel rotary engine was presented to the press and to industry specialists and people like that at a meeting of the German Engineers Union in Munich. Oh, no. Yeah, it sounds like a very exciting place to spend an afternoon. Oh, the German Engineers Union, yeah. Uh, <laughs> probably not in 1960. No, probably not. Probably a lot of grey. Yeah. A lot of grey in 1960. It's a pretty, pretty neutral the, colour. What side of the border were you on? Depends. Uh, yeah. Oh, it was West Germany. It was okay, West Germany. West Germany. Yeah, West Germany. Really? West Germany? Yes, West Germany. Oh, well... Yeah. yeah. Anyway, later that same year, 1960, Wankel managed to marry his oddball little weird engine that sort of answered a question that no one had asked into a teeny tiny little bubble car looking thing made by NSU called the Prince, spelt it, it, German obviously with a Z at the end. Nice. Prince. Prince. Um, Prince. This was when people actually began to refer to that type of engine as a Wankel engine because it okay. was like it had his name on 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 the on the product, you know. Right. Uh. And in 1964, so four years after the concept, uh, the first NSU-built consumer car with a Wankel engine hit the market. It was pretty similar to the crappy little bubble car. It was like a little 
like a little tiny like ice know, setter t- sort of thing yeah like low low power low low capacity kind of yeah hill p50 yeah it's just for driving around town and getting run over by a truck yeah. kind of thing lovely yeah three years later though in 1967 the NSU R080 hit the streets of Central Europe in style with a 115 horsepower twin rotor engine under its bonnet. That's more powerful than many of the cars that I've ever owned. Me too. Me too. Yeah, no, it was pretty nippy, actually. That, I'm sure that was pretty fun to drive. Yeah, the NSU R080. It was well, it's the first rotary engine car to be perceived as any kind of success in the consumer car market. I'm so proud of our little horrific Nazi. Yeah, it was a small to mid-sized kind of family car that was like a little bit sporty looking. Um, received quite a lot of attention at launch, obviously, because it's weird engine design, quite good looks. Um, I mean, dudes just put something in front of people that oh it's completely it's different completely mind blowing. Like mind blowing this yeah. is this is like, radical new technology like at least one one like european automotive publication called it like car of the year wow. 1968 but this is at launch so as with most of wankel's endeavors in his life the car's success didn't last for very long good total production Ran to less than thirty eight thousand over a ten year oh, lifespan. Oh, yeah, good. that's not I'm good. So glad. That's not good. So yeah. most of those sales were very early on. Yeah, um, it quickly picked up a very strong reputation for unreliability, yes. with the engine needing to be fully reconditioned after around thirty thousand miles at oh, best. So... Yeah, so uh, oh. thirty thousand miles at best, or fifteen thousand miles what year, what year at worst. This is nineteen sixty seven. This car was released, right? So yeah, so you're talking nineteen sixty eight. You got to do you do. It depends on how you treat your car. <laughs> you buy your brand new car, and fifteen thousand miles later, it needs an engine rebuild, full engine rebuild. Fifteen thousand miles. Yeah, it's not a lot of miles, is it? Yeah. Oh wow. By nineteen seventy, they'd fixed a lot of the issues with reliability. Um, no, no one cared really? for the rest of his production life. It was just a sort of low volume car for enthusiasts. Really, um, people only bought it because it was weird. Even after it had wow. forced to be a bit more reliable, it was still not that reliable, Rubbish. and it was very inefficient. Burnt lots of fuel and oil. So, a company in the UK during the car's own lifespan, a company in the UK actually produced and supplied conversion kits to owners of the ro80 so they could just swap it out for a regular piston engine um, wow. <laughs> and it was quite successful like, a, like <laughs> yeah so that's so that's so cheesy yeah Aww. so the story of the ro80 ends with nsu being absorbed by the german auto union in 1969 yeah so while it's in production a couple of years after it's launched this... nsu gets taken out bought over by auto union that... so audi yeah like yeah, pretty much. Yeah, now Audi is the only modern manufacturer that's left from the original four that yeah. started it. Um, their four rings badge is actually the original four rings badge mm-hmm. of the auto union signify the four companies that started it. That was in 1932 they founded that, um, just at the end of the Weimar Germany sort of thing. Oh, so just before the Nazis wonderful. came in. So they states so the auto union had been a thing all the way through from Weimar Republic through the Nazis, throughout the other side, and then eventually just got rebranded as Audi. So NSU got bought out by them in 1969. So for most of the car's production run, they were under auto union, and they weren't selling very well. So when they stopped producing the RO80, they just ended up phasing out NSU altogether as a brand. Like, Wankel killed the brand, NSU. Wow. Yeah. So now we get to Mazda. So Mazda is obviously a Japanese car manufacturer. They had seen, they'd seen the early prototypes of Wankel's rotary engines, for some strange reason, they thought it was actually a good idea that just needed a little bit of refinement. Oh, yeah. Look how well that turned out. Yeah. Yeah. Their engineers sort of got to work fixing a few issues with vibration, some of the reliability issues, things like that. They were pretty quick. They put together a working prototype and displayed it at the Tokyo Motor Show in 1963. So Wait, this is. What? Yeah. So this is after Wankel's displayed his one to a few people at the German Engineers Convention or whatever. But before he's launched his car, before the first NSU yeah. car with an engine in it, not even a production car, yeah, before that, Mazda have already got a working prototype. But not only that, not only did they put their working prototype of an engine together, it was a working prototype of a whole car. Oh, that, well, that's much better. Yeah, so 1963 was when they debuted the sporty little concept car called the Mazda Cosmo. You might have heard of it. Yeah. Cosmo would go down in history as a pretty 
like cool car. Yeah. Um, it went on to see production with its own two rotor engine, which provided power to the rear wheels, making it quite yeah. a fun little tiny sports car. Revved up to say ten thousand. Yeah, RPM. something like that. Lovely. It Lovely. screamed. It screamed. It was a hit. Um, I'm sure it was. Yeah, the name lived on through quite a few different cars later on. They weren't all rotor engine cars, but it was such a hit that the name stuck around. Mm. Just trying to picture the Cosmo again. Cosmo is like a little. It's like a. It's a bit like a Lotus Land sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, got it back. Nice. Uh, Mazda had a few successful in quotation marks cars with rotary engines notably the 787b which is mm. you you'd know it's the green and orange one it's oh, yes. a screaming loud high revving incredibly fast Le Mans race car from yes. 1990 there was only ever a couple of them uh it was very very fast but very very unreliable and rarely ever finished a race yeah but was also one of the coolest Le Mans one of the cars coolest race cars era. of all time yeah 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 they also obviously as you know jack made the RX series of sort of mid-range sports cars for the road. This peaked with the RX-7, the final version of which is featured in a lot of video games, and is also Vin Diesel's first on-screen race car in the Fast and Furious franchise. Which I feel is the only... The only necessary fact in this entire episode <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> if we could have just also, left it at that and been okay interestingly with it. though if you listen to the car it's got the wrong sound it doesn't have a it doesn't have a mazda sound to it it's got like a v8 sound in the film so it's obviously been engine swap sensible yeah sensible so they did also go on to produce the rx8 in 2002 but it was a strange design car and it was having a bit of an identity crisis it wasn't really a proper sports car and it still had the reliability issues of the earlier cars, so it wasn't really a practical car either. And basically, I bring it up because you can draw parallels with the sort of opinion and the fate of the RX-8 and the R080, the NSU R080. Mm-hmm. That he, you know, it was launched, and people got an impression of it being no good. They fixed a few of the issues, but it was too late, and the right. RX-8 died. And with it, the RX name also has died. The whole like they haven't released another RX car since then. But Mazda was plenty big enough to just carry on, like nothing ever happened. They didn't care. Yeah. After the failure of the NSU R080, though, Felix Wankel decided he kind of had to finally give up on being a groundbreaking mechanical engineer and return to just supplying a few parts for other manufacturers. Still researching the doomed rotary engines in his spare time. In 1986, he sold his research <sighs> and development center to Daimler Benz, and he eventually died. What? He eventually died of being old and a Nazi on October 9th, 1988. Oh. I was alive when this man died. I am sure this has been said in the past, but I really wish the Jewish Avengers had got to him. Yeah, he never had to face justice for well, decades long active support of mass murder. And he died a rich man in Heidelberg, Germany. It's absolutely disgusting. So, so wait, what you're telling me is that right now, Mercedes-Benz have rights to to the original Wankel engine. Uh, possibly. Because Daimler is Daimler-Benz turned into Mercedes-Benz. Possibly. I doubt they're going to like produce one, though. Ugh. You'd probably hope that was the end of the story for old Wankel. Oh, no. But actually, Jack, he's there just, is more. He's just died. No, 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 no. We're going to rewind a little bit. In 1970, Felix Wankel had established, this is a bit that's going to really piss you off, the Felix Wankel Foundation, oh. an organization which was set up to, quote, promote and support works of humanity, culture, and technology and endeavors that serve to preserve nature and primarily protect animals. I hate this guy. You hate this guy? How much do you hate this guy? Um, like on a scale of one to Nazi, how much do you hate I this I mean, guy? he's like uber Nazi, isn't he? He's yeah, like, he's, he's off the scale. He's off the scale. <laughs> he's, he's too Nazi for the Nazis, and he has the nerve. The fucking nerve. To, he has the nerve to A not put a bullet in his brain yeah no and, he lived until i was alive yeah and b he has the nerve to uh, start he's, he's started this foundation to protect animals and he's put his name on it so yeah the, the felix wankel animal welfare research award was first presented in 1972 
It is awarded for work within the scientific community to champion animal rights within the context of experimentation and developments to help animals in the natural world. This fucking Nazi who called for genocide and war, who was seen wearing a swastika in public in the 1920s and 30s and never apologised for any of it, his name is on an award given to people who promote better treatment for lab rats. It's fucking outrageous. I'm stunned. I... I, how dare they? How? Uh... The last winner that I could find online was from like 2019. Um, but it does seem that either the competition's open right now or it has been won at least once since then. It's just not easy to find results on a website that's written in English. Right. They're all in German. Mm. Um, it's not a huge prize, but it's like it is a cash prize. Like I think it's up to 30,000 euros or something like that. Big enough. Big enough. Either way, this asshole will still be venerated in 2022. And the sad thing is that I don't think that many people who work for animal welfare or who are a fan of rotary engines are at all aware of the complex history behind the legacies of Felix Wankel, the things that still bear his name to this day. I'm not saying like they should scrap the award. I haven't read enough about it. It probably does good by the sounds of things, but they could definitely change the fucking name. I'm, I'm just stunned. You don't even know what to say, do you? Not, not especially. One second. So... So, Felix Wankel produced, helped produce planes and parts for the Luftwaffe yeah. during World War II. Yeah. And I've just had to look it up. Nearly 140,000 dead from the, from Luftwaffe, the Luftwaffe in World War II. Yeah, and a lot of that was, was his work. And he's still being venerated. Yeah, his name's still on this award that gets awarded um, to people who actually do something good in the world. This is absolutely outrageous. Yeah. I I urge everyone to petition this petition fucking and hand back their their awards until it's until name the name's changes. been changed. Yeah, because this is just unacceptable. Yeah, this How... should not be being celebrated. It, uh... So, do you want to know what happened to all of his little Nazi friends? Oh, did they all die horribly? I mean, they're all dead now. That's not good enough. Well, I, they Wilhelm Kepler. The only good Nazi is you probably Nazi. know, apart from you know anyone I've spoken about, of all the other ones I've spoken about, Wilhelm Kepler is probably the one that you know the least about. Yeah, yeah, I would say name so. doesn't name didn't ring a big bell for me no. beforehand. Um, so he was the man, obviously, that made Wankel's business connections for him. He's one of the less known names from the top of the Nazi tree. He was a successful German businessman. He was one of Hitler's earliest financial backers. He was best buds with Heinrich Himmler. Oh and God. that's how he got his introduction to Hitler, was through this mutual friend in Himmler. So you, so you know already he's a good I guy, know, right? I know he's a wonderful human being. Yeah, he's got to be. He's got to be. And... Uh, I, I, Wilhelm sorry. Kepler was born in 1882. He was a chemist and an engineer by oh, trade. Oh, no. Yeah. No, I already know. Where he was a professional going. in the German military, both before World War I and during the war. During the interwar period, he was a manufacturer of chemicals and was a chairman of one of the many subsidiaries of who else? But say it with me, Jack. I G Farben. Yeah. Oh, of Our course, good old friends. Of friends Farben. of the pod, I G Farben. <laughs> yeah, famous friends of the pod. Kepler was credited as the man who found the Nazis their financial backing. But once again, he was ousted from his position, this time in 1936, and he became. Hermann Goering's little lapdog after that point, pretty much. After a couple of years, he was once again given a promotion and he moved to Austria in 1938 to help with the transition to Nazism oh. and then to temporarily lead the Austrian Nazi government before moving again to fulfill a similar role in Slovakia in 1939. This guy gets around. Oh, yeah, this guy gets around. He worked for the SS during the war, oh, administering God. industries which had been seized from murdered and displaced peoples from Poland and parts of Russia. So He's about the worst kind of human. He was a giant piece of shit. And he was the at Jews least... The and the, the Romani and gay people and black people and everyone that wasn't Everyone that German. wasn't... Yeah. A specific kind a of specific German. A specific kind of German. Yeah. And he sent them away to be murdered. Yeah. And then he took over their businesses. Yep. And their lives. And exploited the profits. 
to of. put into building more infrastructure to murder him more of them. As I said, he was a giant piece of shit. At least he was one of the few Nazis that got prosecuted for their crimes after the war. Do you I want hope... to guess how long Kepler's sentence was? I'm going to say he was one of those guys that got hung in a really particularly nasty manner. Kepler so was that... sentenced to 10 years imprisonment in 1949. Oh, no. That's not long enough. But after serving just two, he was released in 1951. And he was the one who helped Wankel secure many of the manufacturing deals that he'd made in the 1950s. You know when I said that the Nazis didn't really go away in the immediate, immediate aftermath of World yeah. War II? That's exactly what I'm talking about. From 1951 onwards, he was back in business. He was helping Wankel secure those manufacturing deals that made him rich and made, him, made it possible for him to build the rotary engine in the first place. This is horrific. Yeah. So, yeah, Kepler was uh, free to live out the last few years of his life as he pleased. He died at his large home in June of 1960. Bear in mind, this guy was born in the 1880s, so he wasn't a young man when he died. Oh, no. Yeah, it's bad, isn't it? It's that's really quite bad. It's really quite upsetting. Yeah. Goebbels, obviously, he famously killed himself at the end of the war when he knew that the Nazis had lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, before he died, though, he did slightly murder his six children, basically for like no reason, because they were kids and they would have able to live lives after he was gone. But no, he decided, like, you know, if I can't have them, no one can or some shit. And him and his wife killed the kids and then took the coward's way out, like Hitler, rather than actually face up to what they'd done. So that's also quite distressing. So we have reached the dead children part of the podcast. Oh, you bastard. Yeah. Don't blame me. Blame the Nazis. I could, I'm barely scratching the surface of Nazis, as you know. Yeah. Robert Heinrich Wagner finally realised in April of 1945 that he'd picked the losing side. And Not the wrong side, the losing side. <laughs> the losing side. side, yeah. So shortly before the Allies marched into Berlin, he went into hiding in a rural part of Germany, pretending to just be like a farm worker. But it seems like manual labour was, like for Wagner, it was like a worse prospect than death. Because in July the same year, he handed himself over to the authorities and he was arrested by the Americans. Wow. Yeah. So... Wagner and Goering, at least, mm. were two of the very few Nazis who were actually put on trial after the war, convicted of war crimes by an international court. New, specially written international law on the rules of war and engagement created the concept of war crimes at all, like in a legal yeah. sense, in 1945 in the wake of the Holocaust, in order to provide a framework for holding people accountable for genocide. Like that whole concept of international war crimes and holding people accountable, that came about after the uh after the holocaust in the wake of second world war because it was so horrific which is a good thing that we did but we shouldn't have needed to yeah so yeah herman goering managed while in custody to uh give an american guard his gold watch some other possessions that he had on him and get the american guard to give him the poison capsules that he had in his other effects that had been confiscated so he unfortunately managed to snip his greasy neck away from the hangman's noose dying sort of half on his own terms in his cell after ingesting a cyanide capsule. I hope they hung his corpse. <laughs> just, just, yeah. I wish. If you Google his name, though, a picture of his corpse is like pretty much the first thing that comes really? up. Really? So, yeah. I mean, ha. that's... Looks pretty pathetic. Good. Robert Heinrich Wagner was found guilty of war crimes, genocide, and being a Nazi piece of shit on the 3rd of May, 1946. Three months later, he was executed by firing squad in Strasbourg. He remained an absolute piece of Nazi shit to his dying breath. I'm I'm not going to quote his last words for you, Jack, because he doesn't deserve that at all. No. I did read them, and they were still vehemently pro-Hitler and utterly unrepentant. I, um, I'm glad he died. In yeah, the... at least we got one of them, eh? Uh, yeah, I mean... You know, we got one in return for died under 12 million. Fire. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty much, pretty much um, most of our story there today i'm very upset by this yeah i thought you might be i <laughs> i was quite upset when i was researching this to be honest like, yeah i thought that there'd be a little bit of something there and it ended up we had this whole podcast episode oh, wow. like the, like it went it, it was worse than i expected i was thinking like oh there'll be some connections with nazis whatever no like top of the tree and then the more you read about them the Big more friends. disgusting the way that it was pretty much just not even like 
like a few a few of them a few of them were like you know and that was it just like yeah get on with things and a lot of them still remain in power in powerful positions not necessarily in government but you don't have to be in government to be powerful do you no, if you've got lots of money if you've got business connections if you can award contracts here there and everywhere then you've got power mm-hmm. and a lot of these people still had that power i say even even um you know if they got locked up 10 year sentence out in two continues that's just shocking yeah it's absolutely unforgivable yeah that's that's uh that's a bit of history for you i have you. i have one final subject left okay, to oh no there have obviously been there were lots and lots and lots of companies as well as individuals who were working hand in hand with hitler and mm-hmm. the nazis famously uh, so yeah i mentioned one of them earlier bmw yeah the company who made your car also made engines for the Nazis, as you discussed. You mentioned uh, the figure of dead. Mm-hmm. The first product to bear the BMW name was a straight six aeroplane engine called the BMW 3A. You, you realize they like the number three, actually, quite a lot. Um, yeah. yeah. Um... It was used to power the Fokker D8F, a biplane that first flew during the last year of World War One, and was renowned by the Allies as being faster and more agile than, like, pretty much anything they it going. sounded really good as well especially in world war one that's very much morally yeah. ambiguous yeah, yeah. i mean be, this was a plane that was world war one plane yeah this was a plane that came out in the last year like airplane development came on a lot during the course of the war yeah i mean it was, it in was the basically last year, just invented right before the war they were still shooting pistols at each other yeah i mean in the first planes. world war they were they, throwing bricks out yeah yeah <laughs> so like these aren't gun planes. These aren't no, the planes that just are a, just kill a... civilians. These are just like reconnaissance planes. It's made out of balsa wood and canvas. I feel like this is the last germ, uh, BMW powered plane I'm going to root for. Probably. Uh, I, it was still shooting down like, you know, allies. Germany lost World War One yes. because the Kaiser was an idiot for starting the war in the first place. He didn't need to. It, it was yeah. unnecessary. He is a silly man. This obviously set BMW back quite substantially in their production of aircraft engines. Mm-hmm. Uh, Post World War One, BMW was incorporated as a company who produced engines for mo- multiple land-based applications, so motorbikes, farm equipment, stuff like that. They also produced some smaller household appliances, mm-hmm. and they made brakes for railway carriages. Yeah, they were doing a little bit of mixed manufacturing. They were, they were a motorworks company. Yeah, they became a kind of a car manufacturer in 1928. Oh no, yeah. But have you ever seen an Austin 7? Yes. Yes. It's a tiny little British car, first produced in 1923, manufactured up until 1939 when Austin's factories were diverted to producing military equipment for the British Army to fight against Germans. Um, it's a very, very, very successful car in Britain. Uh, being as it was really affordable, they ended up building and selling nearly 300,000 of them. Um, wow. Yeah. And they also, that's not including all the ones that they licensed the design for, like for other people to manufacture it overseas. So it got uh. produced under different badges. Uh, sold really well for like three reasons. It was a simple, it was reliable, and it was cheap. And in the 1920s, that was like, and the early 30s, that's what you needed in a car, right? Just getting people mobile. I thought you were going to say it had a rotary engine in it. No, it definitely didn't uh. have a rotary engine in it. It barely even had brakes. <laughs> So BMW bought another car company that were already licensing the designs for building the Austin 7 uh, called Dixie, right? Oh, yeah, what Dixie. a name. Yeah. So in 1928, a version rebadged as the BMW 315 hit the showrooms. No. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the 3 Series um, came out in 1928. No. The, car was, the car was successful, as you'd predict, because all of the Austin 7 rebadging cars were successful. For yeah. the above mentioned reasons. So BMW soon expanded their range with their started designing their own cars. So they started making family cars and sports cars throughout the nineteen thirties. They made some quite cool sports cars actually. Mm. And quickly they developed a reputation for high quality of engineering, which they've pretty much managed to retain, more or less, up to the day. Which is a miracle. It's if quite impressive actually. Considering considering A, we both have one and we've both already within like it breaks weeks, all the time. Within weeks of owning they're it, we have to repair old, though. it. They're really old, though. They are old, they're but old. they're still good. Yeah. Mostly. BMW had begun building aircraft engines again long before the outbreak of World War II. They'd been working closely with the Nazi government to rearm Germany, and the founder-director oh, of BMW, 
a member of the Nazi party since 1933, oh, no. Franz Joseph Pop. He, he'd admittedly, like, he'd had ups and downs with the party. He wasn't, like, a hard-line, top-of-the-tree Nazi. Um, at times, he'd been excluded from party meetings and things like that. But he still decided that all manufacturing resources should be diverted to produce some military aeroplane engines at the very start of the war. And he approved the employment of around 40,000 slave laborers from the Jewish and marginalized communities being persecuted by the Nazis. Like, these were human beings who had been imprisoned in concentration camps, murdered by the millions, and treated as less than animals. They were transported directly from the Dachau concentration camp to the BMW factory in Bavaria to be worked to death for the benefit of the Nazi war of aggression. Pop was made an honorary member of the SS as a result of this, but his minor disagreements with the Nazi party and the fact that the board of BMW thought that although he responded with the right responses, it didn't happen fast enough for them because they were bigger Nazis than him. So he got ousted from his position at BMW in 1942. Just because, as we mentioned, Nazis are the backstabbingest people that you could ever have the misfortune they, to meet. You have to be the exact right Nazi for these fucking lunatics. Yeah. Like, you can be kicked out of the party for being too much of a Nazi. You can be kicked out of the party for not being enough of a Nazi. You can be kicked no... out of the party for being the right Nazi, but not quick enough. And also being the right Nazi, but almost, like, too charismatic. Yeah, yeah, if you're a threat. Yeah. So after the war, Pop tried to get his way back into the company a couple of times. Uh, all that happened was that he managed to get himself arrested by the Allies for having a position in the Nazi <laughs> government. Good. Yeah, as usual, they decided to just sort of let him go. <sighs> uh, he died a free and once again very rich man in 1954, aged 68. BMW continued to support the Nazi war effort until the fall of Berlin in 1945. At the end of the war, their factories were mostly piles of rubble as their immense production output for the Luftwaffe had been the target of concentrated aggression by the Allies. But they were soon reconstructed, although BMW was banned from producing any aircraft or military equipment by Britain and France. So, obviously, they shifted their focus almost entirely onto cars and motorcycles, which they still produce successfully to this day. So, yeah, I could go on all day, to be honest, talking about all of the many, many, many Nazis who were openly supportive of the Holocaust and who made a huge difference towards the actualization of the murder of the most people in the shortest amount of time in all of world history. And then they were able to live happy and healthy lives for years and sometimes decades afterwards with full knowledge of the authorities and people around them. But we should probably save some for the future episodes of the podcast, Jack. Oh, good. Any more thoughts? I hate this. <laughs> um... But are you glad that you know this? Yeah, I, it's definitely... It's definitely Do you feel it's important know. information yeah. that not enough people know about? We're both, well, certainly we're I... both history nerds and car nerds. Yeah. And we didn't know any of this, really. I mean, we knew some of the stuff about the Nazis, yeah. individual well, yeah. Absolutely. Nazi members, but I didn't know anything much about Wankel. I didn't realize that BMW had employed 40,000 slave laborers in their factory. That, yeah, that's horrific. And, and I'm regretting my choice in car. Yeah, it's making me think about whether or not I actually want to drive a BMW. You know, I might just stick with my Volvo. Yeah. You know, I maybe think you I should, might get maybe that you should like, sell the Beamer and buy something else. I'll just get something Swiss. Uh, They've never done anything horrific, have um, they? Maybe I'd. Hmm. Uh, we might yeah. have to get Maybe there. We'll, we'll get to that at some point. We'll get to that at some point, I'm sure. So yeah, that last the last little couple of sections there um, gave a little context as to the scale, as I mentioned before, just the scale of like the, how much these people were allowed to get away with it. Yeah. And how many of them died. Like, I don't know what their net worth was at death, but like you just look at what they were doing. They were all still making big con contracts and business deals. They were heading up companies. I mean... They were they were making lots of money. These people were like millionaires at the point when they died. And like I say, the authorities knew who they were, what they'd done. And they just either let them go entirely in the first place or locked them up for a very short amount of time. And just right, and this is the and just that... let them carry on with their life. They didn't like stop them from having powerful jobs. Yeah. This is a bit that I can't get my head around. At least, like famously, Joseph Mengele fled to 
Argentina. Yeah. And he was never caught. Yeah. And that's the the reference point for like Nazis that survived World yeah, War II. Yeah, you think, right? oh, that's disgusting. But it's also like, well, yeah, but he like went on the run and stuff. And it's like, mm-hmm. you know, people tried to get him. It wasn't like he was just let go. But it's much more actually like shocking and disgusting to find out about the fact that a lot of people who were released. who were like his buddies, who were his work friends, you know, yeah. they all sat around the same table and talked to Hitler. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they... especially if these people were involved in the creation of Zycon B. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're talking about. We've would... talked about two people who headed up subsidiaries, IG Farben, yeah. who were both very, very, very like openly anti-Semitic and who approved of the you know final solution, the extermination of like not just Jewish people, mostly Jewish people, but also, like you mentioned before, disabled people, people of colour, gay people, trans people, uh, people with mental health, people with learning disabilities, basically anyone that didn't fit their mould of a perfect, like, superhuman. Mm -hmm. Which, spoiler alert, most of the Nazis were not that person. Like, you look at them physically, they were not the ideal that they strived for. But that doesn't really matter to fascists. They don't look in the mirror. They can't look in the mirror because if they did, they'd realize who they were. And then they'd probably have to kill themselves like Hitler did and like um, Goebbels and like Goering. Yeah. Not that they, but they killed themselves so they didn't have to face it. Which is... Almost worse because it's almost like they knew what they'd done was so wrong, but they didn't even want to admit it. I don't know. All of it's you can't say one thing's worse than another. They're all they're all it's all horrific. Yeah, it's a bit soul destroying. It is a bit soul destroying. And we, uh, big history nerds. Yeah, we already. I thought I knew quite a lot about this sort of thing, but actually, you start researching basically any topic, and you find out that you don't. Yeah. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for a whole bunch more episodes on. (laughs) <laughs> Things that involve Nazis that you didn't know involved Nazis. Yeah? Right. Yeah. Well, I guess that's going to be it for this episode of why everything is bad, actually. And today we found out why <laughs> rotary engines are bad and why that particular award for animal welfare is bad. And why BMW is bad. Yep. And like... why the uh, the government of Europe post-1945 was bad generally um i'm sure we're gonna have to dig into mazda because yeah i didn't read up that much on mazda i'm sure mazda supported a few things we'll have to see i mean obviously you know the japanese also fought in world war ii exactly someone was building their i don't that was mostly mitsubishi though mitsubishi built the planes yeah mostly yamaha uh, Yamaha wouldn't have been, I don't think they built planes, but they would have been building some stuff. Mm-hmm. Pianos and shit. Yeah, they, <laughs> pianos and Japanese motorbikes. imperial pianos. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so I guess, yeah, that's it. We're going to wrap it up. Save some more Nazis for later. Um, do we have anything to plug, Dave? Not really. Do we not? I, uh, mean, I think, I think you're forgetting. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, if you like Formula One, you can listen to us talking about Formula One. Because, as previously mentioned, we are massive car nerds. Massive car nerds, yeah. If this was a little bit depressing for you and you have any interest in motorsport, go over to there. We're a little bit more cheerful on there. It's called Racecraft F1. If you just search for that on any social media platforms, you should be able to find us pretty easily. As well as on Spotify, Stitcher, and yeah. wherever you, wherever you get podcasts. your podcasts. Yeah, definitely a bit, <laughs> definitely more, a bit more cheerful. Uh, Jack's a definitely bit... a lot more cheerful on that one. Yeah, I, I you I'm won't believe it's the same bit... guy. Yeah, um, I'm a little bit uh, deflated after this one. Yeah. Um, hopefully the next one won't be so horrific. But we'll see. I, I, I have my doubts. I have a feeling that almost anything that we dig into is going to turn out to be pretty horrific in one way or another. Because everything is bad, actually. Yeah, everything is bad, actually. Yeah, um, but on a final note, thanks for listening. This has been horrific. (laughs) (laughs) No worries. Thank you, Jack, for listening to me talking about all of that. See you next time. Bye.